Okay, I think we're going to get started here. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar presentation. This will be the first webinar out of our six-part series running every Thursday for the next six weeks as part of our Forest Invasive Spring Webinar Series. Today's webinar will serve as both an introduction to the series and an introduction to the threats from invasive species in the forest. My name is David Nisbet, and I'm the coordinator for the Forest Invasives Projects here at the Invasive Species Center. So the Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization created in 2011. We connect stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent and control the spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We build networks of experts and stakeholders to identify and act on priority invasive species. We provide funding, coordinate and lead projects in natural and applied science, technology transfer, outreach and education. And we consolidate and disseminate information to raise awareness, leading to the prevention, uh, introduction and spread of harmful invasive species. If you want to learn more about the Invasive Species Center, visit our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Um, our presenter today will be Dr. Taylor Scar. He is the Provincial Entomologist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. He provides provincial leadership to forest health programs, policy, research, and monitoring for both native and non-native species. If you have a question for Taylor during the presentation, please enter it into the side panel of the GoToWebinar program, and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible with the remaining time at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Taylor, and he can take it from here. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Um, well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, as David said, this is a high-level presentation to sort of set the stage for the, uh, the upcoming presentations that are going to be on specific organisms that are of interest to forestry. So we'll try to cover some of the principles of invasive species uh, from very much from an Ontario perspective, because that's where I work, but also the principles apply outside of Ontario as well. No, not getting it. So we'll just start with a few definitions so we're all clear on what we're talking about. The, um, the first one is alien species, and, that, and this comes from the Federal Invasive Alien Species Strategy for Canada. Uh, so it's plants, or animals, and, or, and organisms that um, are outside their past or present distribution. And the, I mean, that's, that's a um, definition based on what we think is, is a, a timeline, so it's a very human-based timeline. And then the second part of the definition is invasive species are harmful alien species whose introduction spread uh, threatens the environment, economy, or society, including human health. And again, this is a very uh, anthropocentric definition because, as the, the last bullet says, it depends on what we care about. And so you'll hear people who are critical of invasive species um, um, issues saying, well, it just depends on what, whether it's affecting things that uh, are important to us. Of course, that's true. If it's uh, not really affecting something that's important to us, then it's not really considered invasive. So um, ringnet pheasants are, for the most part, valued and not considered affecting things that we uh, care about, so they're, they're not considered invasive, although they are introduced. Um, and Ontario has adds a bit to this definition through its uh, invasive uh, species strategy, and that's that the, stra the invasive species are... Um, could be introduced from a new geographic region due to human activity. This is a bit of a political definition in the sense that it, it, it makes sure that we're not having to deal with something like, say, coyotes that have moved in on their own, uh, which would be something for, for governments that have a very difficult time trying to control or restrict. So that's one of the uh, parts of all the definitions that you'll see usually have that political aspect to them to try to narrow it down to things that, that we as governments, depending on which agency you're talking about, actually wants to work on. So starting at, at the uh, historical perspective, this isn't anything really new, except that it's based on what we think the world should look like. So many years ago, when, when Pangaea was uh, used to describe all the continents together, then there was all this mixing of the, of the continents. And now, with um, 
with uh, plate tectonics, those continents have moved apart. And now we think that this is the way the world should be, that what's uh, a species in Europe should stay in Europe and not, not move to, to uh, North America. But now people are doing that and moving those, those species around and eliminating those barriers. One of the things that's done that movement across the, around the world is increase in trade. And this slide shows on the left, it shows the, uh, the amount of, the dollar value of goods being uh, traded with different parts of the world and, and being imported to North America and to the U.S. and Canada. And it stops at 1996, um, but that's okay because a lot of our introductions have, um, that we've been discovering the last 10 or 20, 10 years or so are from introductions that occurred in the, in the 1990s. So things like Emerald Ash Borer, um, Asian Longhorn Beetle, we trace those back to introductions in the 90s. And what we see here is that significant increase in trade with Asia in particular, the yellow bar in the, in, in the bar graph, showing that very great increase in trade. So a lot of our species are coming from there. Originally, our species were European, and we've adjusted to those. So things like dandelions and other species like that that we've had for a long time, we, we're, we're sort of used to having them here. But now with increase in trade from Asia, we're getting the Asian species coming in. One of the ways we're getting these is through container shipments, and um, this is the port of Halifax. The containers are arriving just in time with our just-in-time delivery, so things arrive, they're still alive, and that's one of the concerns now. If you notice in the picture here, the uh, trees in the background, are, are some of them are turning gray, and that's from brown spruce longhorn beetle. So you have a container port in Halifax, and you have the trees getting infested right away. It's not just where the containers come in, though. It's where they get opened up. And from an Ontario perspective, they may come into Halifax, Montreal, or Vancouver, but 64% of the ones coming to Canada get opened in the Great Lakes area in Ontario. So things are coming in. We ignored things for many years because of, you know, the manifest would say it's shipping uh, marble. Well, who would think you'd have to look at marble? But when you find out that the marble is surrounded by low-quality wood that's infested with insects or diseases, then you end up shipping invasive species around. Uh, rope, uh, wire rope with the spools themselves are infested and then being taken out into the forest, used for, for, for logging in BC, and end up moving the species right out into BC, it, right out in the forest. So then you have firewood, live plants, plants for planting, uh, nuts, seeds, pallets that are infested. The two uh, images on the right were taken in, uh, in Toronto last year, um, showing the pallets that had been imported that had signs of insect infestation in them, and then the pallets are just piled outside. Great Lakes Basin in particular is of concern because we have a high concentration of pests. We have over 40 species of economic concern introduced in the Great Lakes area. We have high population of people that move things around. We get lots of container traffic that I mentioned. We have lots of cross-border people moving in across from the U.S. back and forth. We have the deep water ports where the ships come in and bring in and can bring in infested species, infested material, or the logs that are used to brace the loads are piled at the, at the ports. And we have diverse vegetation where the things can get established. And then finally, if something gets established in the U.S. heartland, then it can move across into Ontario like um, Emerald Ash Borer has. So who's responsible for all this? In Canada, at the, at, the, at, the, at the highest level, it's the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA. Um, so they're responsible for the prevention regulation, um, trying to keep things out. So they focus mostly on the border and, and early establishment when it's still in the eradication or containment phase. Um, so rarely do they get into long-term management. And once it gets into that stage, it usually passes to the provinces or to the municipalities or landowners. Um, in Canada, the western provinces, so Manitoba and West, they all have provincial legislation that allows them to control certain species like elm and Dutch elm disease and uh, mountain pine beetle, for example. Uh, Ontario currently doesn't have that legislation, although there is a bill tabled. But we do have authority under the Forestry Act to survey for any species, native or otherwise, and control them on private land. But Ontario doesn't have the regulatory controls at this time to actually control the movement of material. How does that work in Canada? So the CFIA, they do the detection, they have the identification expertise, they have strong expertise in risk assessment telling us how bad it's going to be. That generates a policy document called a D-memo that basically outlines the program that's going to be followed 
and sometimes it's followed by a, a management plan. Um, and then it's the regulations, what we traditionally called quarantines, are put in place to try to restrict the movement. We also work with the, with the um, federal government at the provincial level through critical introduced pest management committees. And several of the provinces have these, not all, but they're, they're under a memorandum of understanding with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the Canadian Forest Service, and then the appropriate provincial ministries in the case of Ontario, it's Agriculture, Food, Rural Affairs, and MNR. And that ensures that there's intergovernmental collaboration to deal with these pests when they arrive. Research in Canada, we benefit from having a strong research community with the Canadian Forest Service, also with universities. In Ontario, the Minister of Natural Resources role is to provide support to those financially or in kind and um, with an idea to say, helping set some of the priority areas that we'd like to see the work done. Management, though, once the pest gets beyond regulatory controls, it moves to are the province being responsible, the landowners, municipalities, they take over once the species are established. But this is an old issue. It's been around a long time. We have species like Dutch elm disease, blister rust, uh, gypsy moth, chestnut blight, large sawfly. Large sawfly is an interesting one where there's indications that tamarack used to be very numerous on the landscape, but is no longer numerous because large sawfly was introduced from Europe, and it um, pupates in the soil. So where it pupates in the soil, it's wet. It drowns, and on dry land, it lives. So it seems to have eliminated tamarack from the dry sites and only grows on wet sites. At least that's the theory, although there weren't enough people paying attention in the 1800s to actually document that. And then European spruce sawfly was thought it was going to eliminate spruce from Quebec and Ontario. But some very strong efforts by the predecessor of the Canadian Forest Service, the Dominion Forest Service, introducing parasites to control that. And you hardly hear, ever hear of European spruce sawfly anymore. Diseases have been around for a long time, white pine blister rust, Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, uh, beech bark disease, you know, it was arrived in 1890 in Nova Scotia, it made it to Ontario, it was discovered in the 1990s. Oak wilt in the U.S., 1944, butternut canker, these things have been around for a long time, so a lot of them aren't new. Uh, Dutch elm disease, for example, some, uh, some data going back a few years, but lots of trees have been killed and millions of dollars have been spent in trying to manage elms in Canada to reduce the impact and maintain elm on the landscape. Gypsy moth is another example. It continues to exist in Ontario, but the introduced fungus helps keep it under control, um, except when your ears were in its uh, hot and dry weather. So, but we know how important these are because of the impact that they have on habitat loss and on biodiversity. And that's, of course, got many people concerned, not just the resource managers that want to, uh, ex in our case, extract timber, but also manage the biodiversity and the ecosystems because of the disruption that invasive species cause. Lots of trade problems with, uh, with material being moved around in trade, sometimes honestly and sometimes dishonestly. Uh, so over 450 non-native species are now established in the U.S. Um, and there's a graph on the right showing the, uh, the insect introductions in blue and the pathogen introductions in red starting in uh, in the well starting to pick up really in the 1800s but really uh, increasing in the late uh, 1900s and, and now into our, the last few years but on average it's about two and a half insects per year getting introduced to to North America what makes them a, such a problem is they're often adapted to the climate in the ecoregion where where they get introduced so that's what we're finding is things coming from northern China are well adapted to our climate in North America. Um, often they're generalists, so they can feed on a variety of different plants or hosts. And um, they can take advantage of different habitats, whether it's urban, urban forests or, uh, or landscape forests or, or large contiguous forests. They often have a high rate of reproduction. So in case of emerald ash borer laying anywhere from 80 to 200 eggs, say, they can lay a lot of eggs in a short time, and it takes a few to start a population to go, to start going. And they're highly dispersive. They can spread very quickly, and uh, they can, they're not just reliant on, um, on, on short-term dispersal. They can spread a long ways, and either by people or on their own. Often there's no natural enemies in the new range because they're occupying a niche that isn't already occupied by some other related species. 
An example of where that doesn't work is, say, Cyrex wood wasp that came in as a European species trying to occupy a niche that is already occupied by native sericid insects. It doesn't do quite as well as it would if there wasn't already something there, and the host trees here already have some resistance to that insect. So it hasn't been as big a problem, say, in North America as it has in, um, in Australia or Brazil or South Africa where there isn't a, a natural ecosystem there. And also, there are, there are a few competitors here that are specialists on it that can actually control the populations. There will often be predators or parasites that will benefit from it, but often they're unable to control the actual population. So woodpeckers and emerald ash borer would be an example where woodpeckers just love emerald ash borer, but there aren't going to be enough woodpeckers to actually control emerald ash borer. What are the impacts? Well, the first one that you see is they're out, able to outcompete native species. So they move into an area and either as a plant or an insect or a disease, and if there's anything else trying to occupy that niche, these ones are aggressive enough that they can occupy it and, and dominate it. Um, they can ruin the habitat for other species. So in the case of emerald ash borer, eliminating ash, uh, then you, the species that are dependent on that are now gone from that ecosystem. Uh, they can alter the forest health and productivity. So uh, they can reduce the growth rate of the trees, or they can kill the trees, or just turn them into, in the case of the long-term impacts of beech bark disease, they just turn them into unhealthy, non-productive trees. They impact ecosystem processes because they stop the, uh, or prevent things from happening that normally would happen in a, in a site. So when you lose ash overstory and you then you get other plants moving in, it's disrupted that whole ecosystem. And it goes, we go on here to uh, affect native, the industry, so industries that are dependent on those those species, like uh, for timber and other goods, are can no longer have access to that raw material. There's economic impacts, just losing that material, and there's effects on human health. Uh, in some cases, such as um, these, the story about emerald ash borer affecting human health by losing trees in the environment, in the urban environment. There are also some secondary impacts, like they facilitate impact um, invasions by other species. So emerald ash borer, when it goes into a site, eliminates the ash, and then dog strangling vine comes in. Um, culturally important species like butternut or black ash used for, for baskets by for First Nations. And then there's also the impacts of the control programs that we have. So if you are impacted by the control program, if you look at the picture on the bottom right, trying to figure out where the quarantines are, and each one is different for emerald ash borer in 2008, it's very difficult to move your raw material around and access it when you're trying to live within those restrictions. This is a slide of the costs say, uh, that municipalities are incurring for emerald dash borer, and some of you might see yourself on here. Um, but basically what it's saying is that the municipalities, this is the only ones that currently are infested that are spending more than $4 million on emerald dash borer, and it adds up to $364 million over the next 10 years for the ones that are currently infested. So that's some of the costs that if you're City of Toronto trying to bring in your budget, and yet you're faced with a, several millions of dollars worth of costs. Why is it urgent? Well, lots of interceptions, lots of high-profile high things like Asian longhorn beetle that take great pictures and can eat our, our national symbol, um, increased trade, lots of people are paying attention to that. And also we have a limited capacity to inspect um, the material coming in to stop the, in, uh, the invasions. We have only so much research capability, and our control programs are limited by whatever products are available and whatever knowledge we have. And through our own efforts, uh, there's increasing public concern about the actual pests as well as about the control programs that we might undertake to try to uh, eliminate or eradicate the, uh, the new invaders. This is a slide from Tony Hopkins and Lee Humble from Canadian Forest Service, but showing what's happening in BC, for example, where several different species are being found in the interior of BC. And this partly makes the point that not all of these invasions are, are invasive. And the introductions are not always invasive in the fact that some of them get in, but they're really not causing a problem yet. But there are lots of interceptions and then lots of introductions into the forest. What are we doing in Canada? Well, we have international agreements with other countries. We have something called the ISPM 15, which requires wooden material, pallets, uh, crates, dunnage, to be treated to a standard of 56 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes uh, to the core of the wood. And that was developed by the International Forestry Quarantine Research Group. 
which is led by Eric Allen, the Canadian Forest Service. He leads that international group. And what it ensures is that the standards to try to prevent material from being infested that's shipped around the world is based on science and a lot of work being done by that group behind the scenes. Uh, we try to guess at what's coming in and try to see what's happening. So when there's a gypsy moth infestation in um, uh, Asian gypsy moth infestation in uh, Japan and Russia and so on, then the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the U.S. Forest Service, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, CFIA, they're all working trying to get a handle on what the seriousness of that infestation is and what might be coming into North America. But things like emerald ash borer that we never heard of before, they can slip through because they're basically unknown in their home range until they get here and they're able to um, invade a niche that something else isn't already in and then they become a serious pest. So those are the hard ones to actually find. But we are doing our best to prepare for the next arrival through things like the Critical Plant Pest Management Committee, uh, the surveys, um, lots of work being done by the Canadian Forest Service to look and CFIA to look at lures and traps to find out what species might be in Europe or in Asia that we need to be looking for here and develop trapping methods to detect those as soon as possible. And then we're doing lots of outreach and communications, trying to get the word out for everybody to know that's what they should be paying attention to and how to report it. And Asian longhorn beetle is an example, the two discoveries of that insect in Ontario, in uh, Toronto in 2003 and Mississauga in 2013 were from people seeing a beetle on the car and reporting it and, uh, and then everything fell in place after that. So we have the critical plant pest management councils in various locations across the country so that we can put the resources together and, and collaborate on a response. The Canadian Council of Forest Ministers is very concerned about invasive species. They have established the Forest Pest Working Group, which is native and invasive species. But this past January, they had a national meeting dealing just with invasive forest species and what they could do at, the, at a high level in government to try to address the problem. There's a national mountain pine beetle strat, a strategic response plan being developed for that insect under that forest pest working group. And it's interesting to note that Saskatchewan and Ontario are the two co-leads for that uh, program to try to s slow down or stop the spread of mountain pine beetle uh, in Alberta to, uh, to the north and to the east. And there's lots of international networking, conferences, um, collaborations. I mentioned the work being done with European and uh, Chinese collaborators to look for lures and traps that might work for insects in, in uh, North America. So we're all trying to work together to collaborate to try to come up with solutions. Specifically, what's Ontario doing? Well, you've heard about the Invasive Species Centre now that David introduced you to it. And that was originally envisioned as a federal-provincial collaboration because uh, Ontario was looking at it saying, well, we know we're going to continue to get these, and instead of just waiting for the federal government to do what we expect them to do, we decided we would join them and try to um, collaborate on various projects and research programs and uh, education outreach and develop uh, some management programs as well. And then the Invasive Species Centre is not just forestry, it's aquatics as well as plants. Ontario has also developed an uh, invasive species strategic plan in 2012, which gives us the policy foundation to do things like establish the uh, draft, the Invasive Species Act, which is uh, a bill that's now in front of the House waiting to see if it gets approved. And we've developed the partnership in, uh, in reporting through the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, who have established a hotline for aquatics and plants and now expanding to forestry uh, pests. Uh, a website for that kind of information, as well as bird detection and distribution mapping system, EDD maps, that allows the public to see and report in on what finds they may have of invasive species, including forestry ones. And that will be up and running this spring, starting with emerald ash borer and a few other um, forest pests coming along. Um, Ontario also supports a fair amount of research done by the Canadian Forest Service uh, universities. And then something's called Surge International, which some of you may have heard about, but that's a collaboration from across the country with several provinces, all the provinces except PEI, uh, some of the territories, the Canadian Forest Service and the U.S. Forest Service doing research on forest pests, forest pest management. And interesting enough, you have provinces like Saskatchewan and Manitoba supporting research on 
trapping methods and biocontrol for emerald ash borer because they want to see the work done before the pests get to their jurisdiction. And we've done the same in Ontario, supporting work on, say, brown spruce longhorn beetle in, in Halifax uh, to get to develop a, um, insecticides and develop the trapping and pheromones for that insect before we get the problem. We also have an extensive forest health monitoring program in Ontario with forest health technicians that are spread across the province looking for the, these invading insects and working to confirm some of the reports that come in from the public and uh, also doing the surveys. So this winter there were staff from MNR's program in Toronto participating in the surveys for Asian longhorn beetle. In doing that survey work we try to coordinate with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency because it still has the national lead and um, they are doing surveys within their own mandate so we co collaborate and coordinate with them to share the, uh, the load and to cover off each other and be co do complementary surveys. So getting into what do you actually do about these species? So here's a short chronology of, of the, I guess I call it the invasion uh, steps. So the first one is is prevention, so we try to put most of our effort into preventing the arrival of, of these species because that's where it's most cost effective. The prevention lead is mostly federal in Canada, so the provinces don't have much role in that except trying to um, lobby for things that they're concerned about or to provide scientific advice or to try to limit the movement of species once they're in Canada. Early detection we talked about, which is trying to find these species as early as possible so that you can still carry out eradication if you can or containment to slow it down. And then a rapid response and eradication program. So if you find it early enough, ideally you respond right away and eradicate the pest or stop it from spreading. The next step is through regulation, trying to um, stop people from making the problem worse, uh, containing the infestation by, uh, slow, by uh, really hitting it around the edges, around the borders to try to stop it, and then slowing the spread which is when it really gets beyond your ability to contain it, but you still don't want it to spread any faster than necessary. And gypsy moth in the U.S. has a, a good example of a slow to spread program. And then mitigation, which is probably where a lot of our management in Ontario at the municipal level, county forests, conservation authorities, they're into mitigation, which is trying to reduce the impacts of the problem. So tree A's and treatments in Ottawa or Oakville or Toronto for emerald ash borer is, is mitigation. Uh, replanting. And um, replanting or underplanting in the sites, that's the next step, which is restoration and rehabilitation, where you actually have to do that either for the pest impacts itself or for the impacts of your own control program. So where trees are cut, say, to um, eradicate an Asian longhorn beetle in the 2003 infestation, then the cities and, uh, and MNR and CFIA supported a replanting program in those areas. Now the next step to look at what you way to look at this though is also not just the chronology, but what's your strategy going to be? What is it you're actually going to do about an invasive species? And if you are going, say, in front of council and you need to develop a an actual plan, what are the components of that plan? The first component that we at the theoretical level, anyhow, that we look at is risk analysis. And risk analysis has three components, and there'll be a, a graphic of this coming up shortly, but Essentially, you start out with risk assessment, and that's what CFIA typically does. So CFIA does a risk assessment, which is looking at the probability of introduction, the likelihood of establishment, the speed of spread, and the severity of the impacts. Once you know that, then you can judge whether or not you need to do anything. And if you do, then that becomes your risk response. And if you are going to do either risk response or not, you still need to communicate your decisions and your actions both internally and externally. But in order to do this, to have a strategy, you need to have a research program either not necessarily done by yourself, but done by others to support the work that you need to answer the questions that you need answered. And you need a strong communications plan regardless of what your management plan is. So here's a graphic of what I'm talking about there showing the three steps, risk assessment, risk response, and risk communications. So you have a trigger, that's the bubble on the left. So something happens, you have a pest arriving, or you know that your, th your city, Thunder Bay, and you know about a particular pest coming from the east, you want to be concerned about it, or mountain pine beetle coming from the west. So you identify that threat, you examine the likelihood that you're going to get it, and when that might happen, and 
what if you did get it, what does it mean? So if you're Dryden and you have 200 ash trees and you're worried, you may not be all that concerned about emerald ash borer. Um, so you develop your conclusions and you describe uncertainties around that. And that's a key point to describe those uncertainties because that's where people who don't want to spend the money on something will say, well, you don't know this, you don't know that, so maybe we shouldn't do anything. But often if you describe those uncertainties right up front and you say, well, I think mountain pine beetle is going to get here in 10 years or 15 or 20, but there's just some uncertainty around that, so then that becomes your research plan on how you reduce that uncertainty. The next step is, based on your risk assessment, is to decide what your response program is going to be. So you identify your management options. What, what are the, op the things that you could possibly do to combat this pest? And do they work? Are they feasible? Are they affordable? And what are the secondary impacts or unintended consequences of actually carrying out the program? You put those rec into recommendations, and that, those go to the decision makers who have the money and decide whether or not to support the program. Regardless of that outcome, then it moves over to the risk communications. And there's three types of communication. One is to senior management within your own organization, trying to get funding from a counselor or from a minister or from a landowner or from a conservation authority. Um, the program delivery people, who's actually going to carry this out, whether it's a contractor or yourself or, or as, um, subordinate staff. And then finally, your external uh, communications to stakeholders, to public, to the media, to let people know what you're doing, whether it's a sign on, on somebody's lawn or whether it's an uh, ad in the newspaper or flyers or whatever it happens to be. So those are the main components of developing an uh, invasive species response program through following the risk assessment, response, and communications. It's important, though, to make sure that as you're going through that, that you include the research um, aspect of it. So where things that you don't know, if you don't think that you have a good trap for, in the case of Cyrix wood wasp, well, then that becomes an obvious uh, research opportunity. So as you go through and you look at those uncertainties that we talked about, then that becomes your research questions and your research priorities. And then you can direct those to whoever you need to to get your research results. And then that feeds right back into your risk assessment or your response program. So if you're looking at Cyrix wood wasp and you don't think you have a good trap, you still think you need to do something, you direct the research and it comes back and now you have a good trap and now you can figure out where the insect actually is and that tells you whether or not you can, say for example, have a um, quarantines in place for that insect. What are some of the challenges for invasive species, forest invasive species? Some of you are familiar with a lot of this, but a lot of it is we're losing the taxonomic expertise, so we need to be able to identify these, these insects and diseases when we get them and know what it is we're looking at. We don't want mistakes there because we don't want something being missed. Surveys are great, but there's significant cost to surveys, and they're not going down. As more and more species get on our radar, then we have more and more things we're trying to look for, and we also have to compete with, in our case in Ontario, the need for looking for native species as well, monitoring those. I have a comment here about invasive plants being disrespected, and it's just making the point that that uh, we sometimes underestimate some of those invasive plants, like dog strangling vine, that are starting to become have an impact in uh, forest operations in South Ontario. Um, European buckthorn would be another example of that. Our pesticide registration system makes it very difficult to get products available for use against invasive species. If a product worked and we want to treat, say, hemlock woolly adelgid in the Niagara Gorge with a product, and we have 50 trees that need to be treated, but the regulatory system says it's going to cost $200,000 to go through the registration process, then there's not much of an incentive for a company to register a product. As if it works, the market is gone immediately. So we don't have a very good registration system for invasive species issues. It's more attuned to agriculture and for Emergencies, but emergencies aren't, that aren't necessarily going away, that are worth the investment of a registrant to get a product registered. There's also saturation. People are going to get tired of hearing about some of these. Um, if you go to a politician today and try to get their interest in zebra mussels, and they say, well, geez, I heard about that in the 1980s. Why are you still talking about that? Um, and then I have the example here of pit bulls. Pit bulls are still biting people, but they're not in the news anymore. People just don't really aren't that interested, but it's still happening. So it's... These things, you get saturation and, and you lose interest. Um, and then finally, there's the dilution factor where there's 
so much information out there that people get confused, the decision makers get confused. Um, there are people saying, well, this species, I think it's invasive too, or you forgot this one, you forgot that one. And the people with the money and the decision power, they get tired of hearing of it, and they, they, then they don't pay attention to the ones that are actually of, of really significant importance. So what's coming? Um, I think we can expect more introductions, but hopefully some of the things like the ISPM 15 requirement and to have all imported wood material coming into Canada and North America that CFI put in place in 2004, we should be reaping benefits from that. So hopefully we have a reduced frequency, um, partly also from increased awareness. I think we'll still continue to see intergovernment collaboration because it's too big a problem for everybody to deal with. And then there's also we can expect things to continue to affect us that are outside our ability to influence. And that's what listed here is panarchy. So we have climate change may make things worse. Um, there are budget constraints that governments are facing. Uh, if you're Alberta and you're trying to manage uh, Mount Pine Beetle and you're Saskatchewan trying to keep it there and all of a sudden the drop in oil, you may lose your funding because of the drop in oil prices means government revenues are down. And then there's shifting government priorities. Uh, so we see that happen quite often where the next next buzzword comes along and they jump on it and they forget about the one that you've been dealing with. What are some of the species on the horizon? Um, I mentioned Mountain Pine Beetle and you're, there's there's no talk. No, there's one on mountain pine beetle this time around. Sorry, there was one before. So um, mountain pine beetle is one that, from an Ontario perspective, is an invasive species. It has moved from its native range in BC across the Rocky Mountains into uh, parts of Alberta that it hasn't infested before, and it's poised to move into the boreal forest portion of Saskatchewan. Fortunately, um, Saskatchewan and Alberta are having aggressive programs there, and a couple years ago, the beetle was within 50 kilometers of the Saskatchewan border, and through some very aggressive surveys and tree felling and burning programs in Alberta, it's now 150 kilometers from the Saskatchewan border. And so it looks like they're having some benefit there of their control program, and it just needs to be maintained both on the leading edge and in the, um, in the, in the, in the areas where, it's, where the major infestations are in the western part of Alberta, so it doesn't continue to feed that invasion wave. But from an Ontario perspective, we're concerned about this. Manitoba and Saskatchewan are as well. Um, but hopefully we have a couple of decades before it would get here on its own. Because if it goes down to endemic levels in Alberta, then its ability to spread long distances will be limited. Uh, but if it goes into outbreak phase, then it could spread very quickly like it did in Alberta when there were strong wind events that moved halfway across the province in one summer. Hemlock woolly adelgid I mentioned earlier. So it's a relatively new discovery in Ontario, in Toronto in 2012, and in Niagara Gorge in 2013. Um, it looks like it came into Toronto probably on infested nursery stock from the U.S., and the Niagara Gorge is probably moving in on birds that are transporting it from New York. So the map in the center there shows infested areas in, in New York, uh, with the yellow areas very close to, uh, to Ontario. So it's not a long ways for uh, birds to carry it across into Ontario or for winds to do that. It has the ability to kill off hemlock trees, and picture in the bottom left is from New York, showing the open canopy of, of the forest that if you've ever been in a hemlock stand, it's normally quite dark, but here you look up and you see all the light coming through. The trees are starting to die and lose their, starting to lose their needles and starting to die. Um, so that's a pest that we are concerned about. Um, so the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, Canadian Forest Service, Ministry of Agriculture, Food, Rural Affairs, and Natural Resources are developing a response plan for that insect to deal with the, the uh, in particular, with the Niagara Gorge infestation. Spotted lanternfly is something you may have heard about. It's a relatively attractive insect if you like these kind of fancy colors. Um, the, it's, it's not a fly, so even though it's a, call it a lanternfly, it's not a fly, it's a plant hopper. And if you want to know whether something is a true fly or not, if the words are joined together, like lanternfly or dragonfly or butterfly, then it's not a true fly. But if they're separated, like blackfly, then it's a true fly or housefly. So that's how you would tell. Um, so a spectacular looking insect. Um, the nymph on the left is red. That's an older nymph. The younger ones are, are deep dark blue. Um, it's one of the few species we found that actually likes to feed on tree of heaven, Atlantis. Um, but unfortunately, you see on the host list that it feeds on many other trees, 
uh, including uh, maples and, uh, and also feeds on grapes. It was found in Pennsylvania, um, in Berks County, just outside of Pittsburgh in 2014, and appears to be cold tolerant, even though the literature says it's not. It seems to be doing just fine in Pennsylvania. Um, and it, that gray moth-like uh, adult on the left, um, and the eggs are also gray that are laid on anything. They, are what, they can get moved around without people noticing them. The eggs in particular, like gypsy moth, get laid anywhere, and then they get moved around. So the state of Pennsylvania has a very strong uh, aggressive control program and where they're trying to cut down the trees and use bait trees and use insecticide trying to kill the insects and, um, and try to stop it where it is. We'll see if they're successful. We don't know yet whether it's cold tolerant enough to make it to Ontario and do anything, but uh, we do know from its introduction to Korea that it really does feed on grapes. So when they cut down the tree of heaven uh, in, in Korea, then the, the insect just moved on to the grape uh, trees and devastated them, grape, the grape vines. And a disease that we're very concerned about in Ontario, we've been looking at this for many years. We haven't found it yet. Uh, it, oak wilt is a, uh, a disease that is in adjacent areas in the United States. It uh, really likes the white oak family, but it will also attack the red oak. No, I got that reversed, sorry. It likes the red oak and will sometimes attack the white oak. Um, it causes these pressure uh, pads on the bark underneath, the picture on the left showing that. You see black ooze coming out of the trunk, then it's, then it's oak wilt. And um, it can kill the trees, and it's, it's mostly transported long distances in firewood, and then there are beetles that feed on those pressure pads, and they, they then transport it to the nearby trees, or it moves in root grafts. So we've been surveying for that this year, this past several years, we've been looking for it, and then we're doing a formal survey this summer where we have staff going to Michigan to get trained on how to look for that. To wrap things up, um, I think Canada is doing a pretty good job at punching above its weight for invasives. We have, you know, a country that is one-tenth the size in terms of population of the U.S. and one-tenth the budget, but we are managing through some very good uh, research programs by the Canadian Forest Service and through uh, efforts by the provinces and the other agencies, municipalities, to try to do their best to combat these invasive species. In forestry, we're probably in better shape than some of the other invasive species areas. Um, we have those national and international agreements. We've been working in pest control for many years. Um, we have monitoring programs for something that we can see. So if you're an aquatic surveyor, it's hard to see what you're looking for, but at least we can see most of what we're after. We have the option for traps for some of the insects, and for some of them we also have control programs. The pest risk analysis approach is being adopted across the country as a st structured and disciplined way to develop your management programs that are defensible to secure the funding and support that you need. And we are also continuing to have strong intergovernmental cooperation and collaboration, and we certainly need to continue to do that. So we are working with European uh, people on, on control programs, on information sharing, and uh, people from, from all, all different countries go to annual meetings on these kinds of things, and we send people from Canada to those locations and get familiar with what the programs are there. So there's a lot of information sharing around the world. We still need to put an emphasis on prevention, but we can't lose the fact that we will also have to carry out containment and management programs when the species do get established. So although the politicians love to talk about prevention and say, yes, that's what we're doing, we still need to make sure that we have the ability to deal with things like, say, kudzu when the plant does, when it did get established here, that we don't just say, well, it's here, so now we're not going to do anything because we're out of the prevention stage. We can be creative and do things like partnerships like the Invasive Species Center, uh, sharing expertise, bringing in new players, uh, people with innovative ideas. Um, you know, Triazin is a good example there where the Canadian Forest Service pursued something that nobody else in the world was really pursuing and looking at the neem tree of India and developing azadiractin as a control program. Others had done it, but not as well or as dedicated and as long-term as Canadian Forest Service had done. Um, and some of this is doable, and that's the stuff we need to focus on, and some of it we won't be able to do. Uh, but there's lots of good things that we can do out there, and it's important that we don't get all depressed about the, uh, um, the invasive species. That it's, it's like in the case of native species, they will come, they will go, they will impact some of the things we want to do. But uh, in, in the end, the world will still be green, and we'll still have lots of trees and, and things for us to manage and enjoy. So thank you. 
Thank you very much, Taylor. That, that was great. So I think we have a few minutes for questions here. So if anyone has a question, you can enter it now into the side panel if you haven't done so yet. Um, I have one question here for Taylor. You mentioned that climate change can impact invasive species. Could you expand on this a little bit? So how, how will a change in climate, climate um, influence invasive species infestations? Okay. That's, well, thank you, David. That's, there's two parts to the answer to that question. The first part is that we've been lucky that, say, some species that can't establish here because our climate hasn't been conducive to their, to their establishment will may, may be able to become established if our climate changes to the point where it, it now is favorable to them. So that's one thing that we'll have to watch for is things that we thought we might be safe from may be able to become established here. So things that aren't cold tolerant, like spotted lanternfly is an example that maybe with climate change it, it is able to establish here. The second part is that in, invasive species that arrive here without their full suite of controls, their natural controls that they have in their home range, are probably the ones that are most likely to become eruptive or outbreak stages in the event of climate change when there's disruption to the ecosystem. So if you take something like pine false webworm that's been here since the 1950s and affecting plantations in some highly stressed red pine trees, but for the most part it's very isolated in its, in its damage, if under a new climate system it's able to escape the natural predators and controls that, that the limited ones that are here from its native range, then it might erupt and become a very serious pest in the future just because it doesn't have its full suite of natural controls so when the system is disturbed, it can take advantage of that right away. Okay, we're getting a few questions on uh, if this presentation will be made available, and we will uh, post this presentation on our Forest Invasives website. So once we uh, process it and save a copy, we will be posting one. So you can access it at forestinvasives.ca at any time. Um, Taylor, one other question, what what can people do to stop the spread of invasive species? So is it just don't move firewood or are there other steps that, that someone could take? Well, firewood is certainly an obvious one for, for us in the forestry business because a lot of our pests move that way. And it's not just ones that we know about, like emerald ash borers, ones that get established and move before we know about them. And, and emerald ash borer is another example of that because it was moved around a lot before we ever knew it was here. And so the infestation, say, in Toronto and Ottawa, uh, Quebec, were probably for people transporting the material long before we had ever even discovered the insect. So firewood is certainly one of those. Um, I think it's important to, to follow some of these principles ourselves and when we're doing things like, you know, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council has a look before you leave program, which I think is ideal in terms of advising people that you need to pay attention to what you're leaving behind when you leave these sites. So whether you are coming out of a site that has, um, that you've been out surveying for oak wilt, uh, you might want to uh, clean off your material if you're transporting soil. So, you know, sudden oak death in uh, Phytophthora remorum in uh, California was probably getting spread a lot by people going and surveying for it. So you want to make sure you're not the ones that are spreading these things around on your bicycle tires when you're mountain biking or when you're uh, on your boots or those kind of things. So you can establish vehicle wash stations and you can establish um, tire wash stations and things like that, it's making sure you're not the ones doing it. And then just helping people understand when you see them doing something that's high risk, um, then you might want to mention that, that it is so that they're not the ones making this worse because some of us in our own business think, well, those rules apply to somebody else, but no, they, they apply to all of us. And so if your municipality is importing something from a long ways away, you might want to say, well, maybe you should check that first. If you're bringing in hemlock from the U.S., then you might want to make sure you're not bringing in hemlock woolly adelgid. Okay. Uh, we have a question here on gypsy moth. So will control programs that target gypsy moth impact native insects such as native butterflies or moth species? The control programs being done for gypsy moth, right now there are two products that are used. Uh, well, one product used mostly is BTK, the bacterial insecticide. And it does have uh, it's not specific to gypsy moths, so there, if there are insects that caterpillars of moths or butterflies that are out feeding at the time that the BTK is sprayed, then uh, they could have their population reduced. BTK is not uh, effective enough usually to, to wipe out a population for even the target insect like gypsy moth. 
it kills about 60 to 80 percent of the gypsy moth. There's lots that still survive uh, that make it through. And so the same thing would happen to our native insects. And also the BTK is only um, viable for about four days. It dies from ultraviolet light. So it's those insects that come up a week later are not going to be impacted because the BT is is uh, is uh, no longer alive. It's not they. It's not a vac, not a live bacterium anymore to to affect the other insects. So it does have uh, some usually some non-target impacts that are minimal and they're and then they're temporary because usually gypsy moth spraying is done on a, on a small area. So there's also reinvasion of that site from the surrounding populations. So the impacts, if they are do occur, are usually minimal and very short term. Um, one other question here. Are we overdue for a tent caterpillar outbreak? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ontario is overdue for a forest tent caterpillar outbreak. Uh, there is a starting one in northwestern Ontario, um, and it's been going now for about three years, Where, but it hasn't taken off in the speed at which we would have expected. So we're, we should be up at anywhere from 5 to 10 million hectares now of, of um, of gypsy moth defoliation, or sorry, of forest and caterpillar defoliation, and, and it's not there yet in northern Ontario, but we're seeing indications it's starting to show up in northeastern Ontario, and I would expect over the next three to five years that it will be in the 10 to uh, 10 to 15 million hectare range in Ontario, where it's going to be uh, across most of the hardwood range down into uh, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Okay, and we have uh, one final question here. Do you use ecological niche modeling to assess the potential invasion of pests in Canada? Yes, we do. We do look at the at the niche of the of the um, of the of the target species, the one we're worried about, and what it's going to move into, and what it's possibly going to uh, try to compete with. So, you know, Cyrix wood wasp is an example of that, where. When doing the risk assessment for that insect, we looked at it and said uh, the niche for that insect is already occupied by something else. We did fund research by uh, Kathleen Ryan at the University of Toronto who looked specifically at that to provide us with the data on how well it would compete with native insects, how well its fungi would compete with the fungi carried by native insects, and whether the tree resistance would be able to uh, uh, give us some benefit and, and fight off the attack. And the conclusion was that the, that niche was already occupied, that Cyrex wasn't aggressive enough, and its fungi, fungus isn't aggressive enough to compete with the native insects. So they basically coexist in the, in the same trees without the insect having much impact unless it's already lost 85% uh, of its foliage. Okay, well, on behalf of everyone, I would like to thank you, Taylor, for joining us today and giving us some insight into the world of invasive species management. Um, I also want to thank everyone at your computers for tuning in today and listening, and I would encourage all of you to check out our website at www.forestinvasives.ca for more information on invasive species, and also to check out uh, our digital workshop tab for the webinar series where you can register for the other parts of our series, which will be running every Thursday for the next six weeks. So I hope to see all of you back here next Thursday. Thanks and have a great day.